Sorry, everyone. You and I'll tell you. I am not the talented musician that will be up here in five minutes. <laughs> My name is Greg Stucy. I'm the vice president of the Friends of the Waterbury <coughs> Library. And what we do, we're like the fundraising arm of the library. And the library, being part of the municipal government, has their budget, but they can't go out and request more funds. So, so that's what we do. Um, being, you know, a nonprofit 501c3, um, that's what we do for the library. Through our generous donors, last year we've been able to help buy the digital streaming service called Canopy for the uh, for the library, as well as some new um, Rachel's going yeah, <laughs> as well as some new uh, this year some new rocks which have words carved in them for the uh, for the word garden, as well as in the spring and the summer some plants and flowers for the for the garden. Um, and if anybody is interested in donating, I think there will be some donate, donation envelopes to the table in the back. Which, speaking of that, I failed to mention there is water and some, some shortbreads and tasty things in the back. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Rachel Muse, the library director. She's in the back. <laughs> she, she is a wonderful liaison with the friends. Um, her enthusiasm is contagious. I actually volunteer in the library as well, so it's a pleasure to work with her. And I'd also like to thank Judy Byron, the adults program for the The friends sponsored the event, but Judy did all the heavy lifting with organizing and planning. So again, thank you, Judy, and I'll turn it over to you. So I'm so glad to see everybody. And uh, we heard from Jeff, and he said, all you have to do is put Celtic in the publicity will come. So there we are. Um, Jeff is a multi-instrumentalist, and he brought a few of his instruments. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a Celtic bazooki, but there is, and you'll get to hear that. The auto harp I had the uh, privilege of playing earlier, and it is gorgeous. And he has, I think, just the, 12, the six string, right? No 12 strings today. But hey, that's okay. We've got three instruments, you know? Um, and um, he, um, not only has he performed for audiences of all ages and so forth, but he's been all over the country and the British Isles. And what you're going to hear tonight is his love of the British Isles and how the history comes through in song. And that's, for me as a musician, how I learn if it's through song, I'll retain it. Um, and Jeff, uh, he is also featured in the Acoustic Guitar Magazine, and he is a contributing writer to Acoustic Guitar Magazine and Auto, auto Harp Quarterly. I didn't know there was an Auto Harp Quarterly, but apparently there is. And I want to turn it over to Jeff because you're not here to listen to me go blah, blah, blah. You want to hear Jeff perform his magical instrument. So welcome, Jeff Snow. Scare a kid before you sit down. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's going to be fun. And the cares of tomorrow 
can wait till this day is done. Come by the hills to the land where life is a song. And sing while the birds fill the air with their joy all day long. Where the trees sway in time, even the wind sings in tune. And the cares of tomorrow can wait till this day is done. Come by the hills to the land where legends remain, where stories of old fill the heart and may yet come again, where our past has been lost and the future is still to be won, and the cares of tomorrow can wait till this day is done. And the cares of tomorrow can wait till this day is done. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It is an honor to come to Waterbury, Vermont tonight. I have not been to Waterbury specifically in many, many years. I passed through it from time to time. And it is just very nice to be here tonight. It struck me as I drove into Waterbury today that uh, Waterbury is known for the ice cream business. And that's something you can't get away from, probably. And I came to you from the home of what is left of Friendly Ice Cream. I live in Wilbraham, Massachusetts, which is where Friendly's plant is. And they, they still make ice cream, and they still do all those things. So I went from one ice cream place to another today. <laughs> the first tune that I played for you is an old Irish song based on a poem. And that last line of the song, the cares of tomorrow can wait until this day is done. Isn't that special? Isn't that a great line? Musicians hear other people's things and they say, I really wish I'd written that. <laughs> and I didn't. Um, the second one, some of you recognize, it's an old English tune. Um, we play it this time of year. It's called In the Bleak Midwinter. It's a pretty tune. We're going we're gonna to touch on all of the Celtic lands tonight. We're going to kind of wander in and out of Christmas. We're not going to... I'm not going to throw a whole barrage of Christmas things at you, and I'm not going to throw a whole barrage of Celtic things at you. And I'm just going to kind of jump back and forth, and I think you won't have any trouble at all keeping up. Well, one of the things that I like to get out of the way quite early every night is this. We're going to play from the Celtic lands, which are Scotland, England, Ireland, and Wales. And I am a Scot. Um, my dad was a drummer in a bagpipe band. 
my great great grandparents came over in the Highland Clearances. So I grew up listening to bagpipe music in the house and Scottish folk songs. That's pretty much all I listened to as a child growing up. And some of the things that you hear from me tonight will be pieces of music that I learned as a child. Now those of you who are parents will know that when you became a parent, you raised your children the way that you were raised. So when my kids were little, we would pack everybody in the car, and I had these cassette tapes back then. I would pop in a cassette tape of bagpipe music, and off we'd go for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's what I knew. It was, what, it was just normal for me. And so I tell you all that to tell you this. A couple of years ago, my birthday rolls around, because it's one of those things you can't control. And I went out to the mailbox, and in the mailbox was this, this wee little package from one of my sons who now lives in South Carolina. Now those of you who are parents will also know that when that happens on your birthday, your first thought is, isn't that nice they remember, they remember dad's birthday or mom's birthday? So I went in the house all pleased and proud and full of myself, and I put the box on the counter and I opened it up, and inside was a test kit from Ancestry.com. <laughs> <laughs> So I took a deep breath and I called my son and I said, thank you for remembering me on my birthday. What's the point? And he said to me, well, dad, and, you know, when, the, when the sentence starts with well, dad, you know it's not going to end well. <laughs> and he said, my brothers and I were little, it was Scottish this and Scottish that all the time. And now we're going to find out exactly how Scottish you are. <laughs> Oh, he also put in the part about how I had them convinced his children that McDonald's was a Scottish restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> he was not a happy soul. <laughs> okay. So I took the test because I knew where my family came from. So I sit here before you tonight very proudly telling you that according to the smart people at Ancestry.com who get paid lots of money to know these things, I am 83% Scottish. That's a big number. That is a big number. So if we all start marching around and, and killing cows and doing all the things that the Scots do, you'll know why we do that. I'm going to play for you one now that you might know, you should know. It is what we call in the music world a piggyback song. A piggyback song is, is when you take one melody or one piece of music and you just keep writing new words for it and it keeps popping up in different places. And this one, uh, beautiful English folk song that we just take out at Christmas time and call it something else.
really particularly good stuff. I want to make sure that it is. Thank you, William. Michael Considine was born. Remember that name. Michael Considine was born in County Clare, Ireland, in the little village of the Rising Road called Spansel Hill. In 1851, Spansel Hill was kind of a happening place, but not so much anymore. In 1851, there was Michael Considine, and as he was growing up, he realized, as so many other young men did at that time period, that there was no future at all for him in Ireland. And if he was going to make something of himself, it would need to be someplace else. Ireland lost somewhere around 40% of its population in a 10-year period uh, to America. It came, just came over here. 40% is a lot. So across the ocean came Michael Considine, and he settled, he came into Boston, and he settled there for a short time, a little bit less than a year, before realizing that there were a lot more Irish lads looking for work in Boston than there was work for them. And if he was going to make something of himself in America, it would need to be someplace else. He had heard of the prosperity in California and all the things that were going on out there with the gold rush and all of that. So across the country he went. He settled in San Francisco. He spent the rest of his life in San Francisco, and Michael Considine died in San Francisco in 1873. He was 22 years old. History does not tell us what Michael Considine died of. Back then, they didn't write such things down. They didn't write down causes of death. They just kind of drew a line through your name or checked you off and moved on. But it does tell us this. When Michael Constantine was dying, he knew that he was dying. Whatever he was dying of took him progressively. It was not something that happened suddenly. So he knew that he was dying. And that made him very sad for a couple of reasons. The first and most obvious reason is that he was 22 years old and he knew he was going to die. But the second reason is that he knew that he was never going to get back to Ireland and back to his village. You see, back then when the immigrants came here, it was a mark of their success in America to make enough money, to gather enough resources to go back to Ireland and say to your family, look at me, I went to America, I'm a success, I came back here. And most often they would come back to their villages carrying a handful of money for their family to help their family get by. And that was just a measure of their success. And that was never going to happen to Michael. That made him sad. Not long before he passed away, he had a dream one night, a very, very vivid dream. And in that dream, he went back to Ireland. And in the dream, he did all the things that he would have done had he been able to go there. He went and visited the house that he grew up in, saw his relatives, and he even found his old girlfriend. It was, it was a very, very vivid dream. And when he woke up in the morning, he made a series of notes based on the dream. And he took those notes, and he turned them into a poem. Mm -hmm. This is the good part. With all he had happening in his life, Michael Considine had the foresight to take that poem, put it in an envelope, and mail it back to his nephew in Ireland. That is the only reason that poem survived all of these years, is because he had the foresight to do that. This is Michael Considine's poem. Last night, as I lay dreaming of pleasant days gone by, my mind was bent on rambling through errands I'll I did fly. I stepped aboard a vision, I sailed off with a will, till we gladly came to anchor at the cross on Spansel Hill. It being the 23rd of June, the day before the fair, 
Aaron's sons and daughters, they were all assembled there. The young, the old, the stout and the bold, they came to sport and kill. It's a curious combination at the fair on Spansel Hill. I went to see my old home, as every stone could tell. The old boreen was just the same, the apple trees over the well. I miss my sister Ellen, my brothers Pat and Bill. There only were strange faces at the house on Spansel Hill. I went to see my neighbors to hear what they might say. The old were getting feeble, the young ones turning gray. I met with Taylor Quigley, he's brave as ever still. He used to mend my bridges when I lived on Spansel Hill. I took a flying visit to my first and only love. She's pure as any lily. She's gentle as a dove. She threw her arms around me, saying, Michael, I love you still. She's not the ranger's daughter. She's the pride of Spencil Hill. And then I stooped to kiss her, as I did in days of yore. She said, Michael, you're only joking, as you often were before. The cock crew in the morning, he crew both loud and shrill. I awoke in California, far, far from Spencil Hill. And then my vision faded, and tears came to my eyes. I hoped to see that dear old land once more before I die. May the joyous king of angels his choices blessings spill on that glorious piece of nature, the cross on Spansel Hill. This is not, this is not a Christmas song, per se. Um, many of you will recognize the song. It was written by a man named Tom Paxton. Tom Paxton is an old folk singer, and he, he finally, I think, has just come off the road in the last year or two. Um, he, he wrote many, many great things, and this is one of his songs that I kind of changed it a little bit, just a couple little pieces of it the kind of fit for Christmas and for kids. You guys ready? Me too. One Christmas morning I awoke a happy little boy Found my father had for me a marvelous little toy A wonder to behold it was with many colors bright And the moment I laid eyes on it, it became my heart's delight It went zip and it moved and boom and it stopped and brrrr it stood still Why are you laughing? <laughs> you 
you know how hard it is to do that? <laughs> it's probably even harder when you don't have any front teeth. But, but we're going to try it. Will you help me? It went zip and boom and boom when it popped and burr. Can you do that? Burr. It stood still. I never knew just what it was, and I guess I never will. Well, the first time that I picked it up, I had a big surprise. Right on the bottom were two big buttons, and they looked like two green eyes. I first pushed one, then the other, then I twisted its lid. When I set it down again, this is what it did. It went zip when it moved, it stopped, it stood still. I never knew just what it was, and I guess I never will. Well, it first marched left, and it then marched right, and it then marched under a chair. When I looked around again, it wasn't even there. I started to sob, and my daddy laughed, because he knew that I would find. When I turned around, that marvelous toy came chugging from behind. It went zip when it moved, when it stopped, it stood still. I never knew just what it was, and I guess I never knew. The years have gone by too quickly, it seems. And I have my own little grand boy. And on Christmas Day, I will give to him that marvelous little toy. His eyes will pop right out of his head, and he'll have a squeal of glee. Neither one of us knows what it is. It just like me, and it'll still go zip when it moves. <clears throat> when it stopped, Burr, it stood still. I never knew just what it was, and I guess I never will. faces looking back at me with repressed middle school memories. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that laugh the hardest are the ones that are having the memories. You thought you were rid of this and you only thought that. This is an auto harp. And many of you are familiar with it and many of you are probably not familiar with it. So the reason I say middle school memories is the short version of all that is that there was a period of time from the late 1950s through the end of the 1960s when the Oscar Schmidt company, the company that made still makes commercial, commercial auto harps, got the marketing idea that if we put auto harps in every middle school that we can find up and down the East Coast, every middle school child will get exposed to the auto harp, every middle school child will love the auto harp, and when their birthdays and Christmas roll around, we're going to sell gazillions of auto harps. Well, I guess there was some merit to the, to the idea, but because they were giving them away, they had to make them as economically, cheaply as possible. So they made them out of plywood. And those of you who understand acoustic instruments know that plywood has no resonating properties whatsoever. <laughs> so you might as well just put some strings on the floor and just have at it. <laughs> they painted them black because that's a, that's a great color for kids. They painted them black and put strings on them. It didn't work very well. The instrument was designed to be played flat on a desk, very simple, and just strummed. Didn't sound anything at all like that, but you get the concept um, of how it was supposed to be played. Um, and it didn't work out very well. Somewhere in the late 1970s or the very early 1980s, Somebody rolled along and said, hmm, let's take the auto harp out of the musical closet. And uh, there has to be a harder way to play this. 
So, <laughs> I told you I was a Scot. And if you know any Scots, we, we start at the hard way and work backwards. <laughs> we, don't, we don't ever sneak up on them. So what, what I'm going to do for you tonight, can you hear it okay in the back? What I'm going to do for you tonight is I'm going to play it not the way it was intended to be played. With a funny sentence. I'm going to finger pick it like you finger pick a guitar or a banjo or something like that. I saw this done in the YouTube video once. How hard can it be? <laughs> You're laughing at me. I haven't done it yet. There are 37 strings on this auto harp, 37. The standard auto harp configuration is 36 strings. Being a Scot, when I had this one built, I wanted an extra string. <laughs> Why? Because I'm a Scot. If 36 is hard, 37 is harder. Every time I push down the button, it creates a different musical chord or a different palette of notes. And it does that by muting out certain notes. Certain notes are just muted out, they don't play. So if I do this, it sounds very pretty. But if I do it slower, you can hear the strings that click and they don't ring. So about half the strings ring and about half the strings don't ring every time I push down a button. And the combination of strings that ring and don't ring is different depending upon the button that you push down. And the strings are only like that far apart. So it's just, if you watch me play it, I never look at my right hand. And that's because you can't think that fast. You just have to teach your hand where the strings are and go get them.
go to Wales. We all do that little piece of the United Kingdom that kind of gets ignored sometimes, and it's a really kind of beautiful little place. Mm -hmm. I'll play a couple of Welsh tunes. The first one is uh, it's another one of those piggyback things. It's a very pretty tune all by itself, and some of you will recognize it for what it is. It's a tune called Ash Grove. Um, those of you who don't know it as Ash Grove, you might know it as Ash Grove. The music from Ash Grove has been been borrowed and stuck in every hymnal that you can find has some version of Ash Grove with their own hymnal words for it. Uh, it's just that pretty melody. And then uh, I will kind of pair that one up tonight with another Welsh tune that you might know. A beautiful little Welsh lullaby called Off Through the Night. Breaking out over in, over in Europe. Over on the west coast of Scotland, in a wee small village known as Campbellton, Scotland. It's kind of the southwest corner, if you will. Campbellton, Scotland, there was a man named George McIntyre. And George McIntyre was a piper in the village bagpipe band. Every village in Scotland to this day has their own pipe band. And Campbellton had one then, and George was in it. But when the War started out, he did as so many other young men did. And he went off and he joined the British Army to do his part for the Great War. Off he went to Germany and he was not there for very long before he was captured and held in a prisoner of war camp for the duration of the war. He spent his time in captivity playing his bagpipe tunes over and over and over again in his head. It was a way of staying connected to his music, connected to the bagpipe, connected to his village, and probably connected to his sanity in some ways playing his bagpipe tunes. While he was there, he wrote a bagpipe tune in his head. And when he got back to Campbellton at the end of the war, he taught it to the bagpipe band. And from there, it has taken off. You don't hear it much in America, but if you go over to Scotland and you see the pipe band coming down the street, it's quite likely you will hear this one at some point. He calls his tune, The Hills of Argyle. <laughs>
watching the smiles. This instrument is special. And as special as it is for you, it is more special for me. Uh, it has taken me to all kinds of different places in the world to be able to play this. The joy of people like you. Uh, I, as Judy told you, I can play a lot of instruments. And I just have a kind of small smattering of them here tonight. But when I am home and the house is dark and quiet, this is the one that I will pick up and play for myself. And I will just kind of sit in a chair and just let it go. It's, it's really that special. So I'm going to put it down now, but my promise to you is that before we're done tonight, I will pick it up again. Okay. You okay with that? Yeah. We're going to roll over here. Just because... Back in the 1700s and in the 1800s, when the merchant ships would leave the various ports in the United Kingdom to go off and deliver their wares around the world, they could be gone for upwards of seven years before getting back to where they started. Now that sounds crazy, but you're thinking about that today. Think about it in terms of the times back in the 1700s and 1800s. You've got a ship full of whatever, and you're leaving Dublin to take it to Boston. Well, it takes you seven to eight weeks just to get there in an old sailing ship that's loaded down. And then you have to wait a couple of weeks to get in to the harbor. And then you have to wait your turn to unload. And then you have to unload it by hand because there were no cranes or gantries or any of that. And then you went back to the end of the line to pick up a load in Boston. And you might wait a couple of months for that and then take that load every, anywhere in the world that it was going. And so you, pretty soon you're hopscotching your way around the world, and then you might not get back for seven years. So look at it this way. You are the wife or the girlfriend of a sailor. It's time for him to go. You walk him down to the pier, you kiss him goodbye, up the gangway he goes, he waves, you wave, and then you go home. And you wait for upwards of seven years to see if he comes back. Sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. If he didn't, you didn't know why. He just didn't come back. The ship might have sunk, the pirates might have gotten him. He might have found somebody he likes better in another place. I'm sure all of those things happened. You just, you didn't know. There were no cell phones back then. He couldn't call you and say, hey, I'm just gonna hang out in Asia someplace. He was just gone. As with so many things that you're learning in the Celtic world, the way they record the history is somebody writes a song about it. This is a song about an English sailor. His name is John Riley. Kisses gave her one, two, and three. 
weep no more, my long to love. I am your love, lost John Wiley. Weep no more, my own to love. I am your love, lost John Wiley. Sad music on the bazooki. I've tried, it's never worked. Okay, you have been sitting very nicely for the better part of an hour. And this is the moment you have been anticipating for the better part of an hour. You just didn't know that you weren't anticipating it. <laughs> Maybe you'd better sit with this part I've been anticipating for the better part of an hour. I have been doing all the work so far, haven't I? <laughs> this is the part where you're going to sing for me. <laughs> You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. I checked with Rachel and Judy at the library and they said the people in Waterbury, Vermont, they're well above average. This will be easy for them. <laughs> they can do anything you ask of them. That's what we're going to do. We're going to sing a song and I'm going to give you five words, part of the chorus. Five words. That's not hard now, is it? But I want to tell you the backstory because with so many things, I have the backstory that goes with this. I told you about my dad, I'll tell you a little bit about my dad in the beginning. My dad's name was Donald. And it's, of course, it's a Scottish name, isn't it? Yeah, they're all named Donald. Yeah. And uh, my dad's name was Donald, and his, his, one of his very closest friends was also a Scot, was also named Donald. And uh, Donald and Donald would get together when I was a wee lad in the house, and they would listen to the folk songs, and they would march around the house and they would sing and they would do all the different things that they do in the house. And as they did that, more often than not, they would invite their friend Johnny Walker to join them. <laughs> you know him, sir, do you? <laughs> Johnny Walker would always be the first one to be done. They would march around the house and they would sing the song, but when this one particular song popped up, I even knew as a wee lad did it. When this one came, it was going to get sung over and over and over again. It's a song about a man named Donald. And this Donald lived up in the Isle of Skye, which is off the northwest corner of Scotland. It is maybe the most beautiful place you will ever go if you've ever been there. It is phenomenal. And th this is a long time ago. When Donald left Skye, he thought he would go on vacation to London, which was a pretty big deal because back then the Scots didn't go to England because they didn't get along terribly well, if you think back. But he went anyway, wearing his kilt. And the ladies in London were taken back by such a thing as a man wearing a kilt. They had never, they'd never seen anything quite like that before. They expected him to be wearing his trousers. That's what the English people would call pants back then. And not a kilt. So when he walked around in London, the ladies would just look at him and say, Donald, what are your trousers? <laughs> Somebody writes a song about it. Yeah. And we're going to sing the song. It's okay, Mom. It's just not Mom. Yeah. <laughs> we're good. We're good. And you're going to help me sing the song. You're gonna, so I will sing the first line of the chorus, and you will sing to me the second line of the chorus. Easy enough? Mm -hmm. My part, first line of the chorus is, let the wind blow high. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to share with us what you're finding so funny, man? <laughs> I bet you're really glad I'm not wearing the kilt right now. <laughs> and you will sing back to me, let the wind blow low. Simple enough, it goes just like this. Let the wind blow high, let the wind blow low. Ready? Let the wind blow high. Wind blow low. Perfect. Through the streets and the kilt don't go. Oh, the lassie shout, hello, Donald, where's your trousers? I just come down from the Isle of Skye. I'm all very big and I'm awful shy. The last sea shout when I go by. Donald, where's your trousers? Let the wind blow high. Let the wind blow low. Through the streets in my kilt top go. Oh, the last sea shout. Hello, Donald, where's your trousers? Well, I went down to London town and I had some fun in the underground. The ladies turned their heads around saying, Donald, where's your trousers? Let the wind blow high. Let the wind blow low. Through the streets in my kilt top go. All oh, the lassie shot. Hello, Donald, where's your trousers? Well, the lassie took me to a ball. It was slippery in the hall. And 
I was afraid that I might fall, thought I wasn't wearing the trousers. Let the wind blow high. on a highland man, cause they won't wear no trousers, let the wind blow high, all the lassies shout, hello, Donald, where's your trousers, Joe, where that kilt is mighty light, it is not wrong, I know it's right, the highlanders would get a fright, if they saw me wearing trousers, let the wind blow high, Because of that, I'm going to reward you. Yes, you did very well with that one. I'm going to give you another one. Let's do an Irish sing along this time. But instead of just five words, I'm going to give you the whole chorus to the song. The whole chorus. See, you can do this, I know that you can. This is your part. Ready? Mary Mac's father's making Mary Mac, marry me, my father's making me Mary Mary Mac. I'm gonna marry Mary, so my Mary to take care of you will always feel Mary when I marry Mary Mac. That's your part, I got the rest. Here we go. <laughs> no, huh? Okay, fair enough. I will sing Mary Mac's father's making Mary Mac marry me. You will sing back to me. My father's making me Mary, Mary, Mac. <laughs> now, would you like to come up and help me? Because you seem to know all the words. You could kind of lead them. No? You don't want to do that? My father's making me Mary, Mary, Mac. That's your part. It will sound like this once we get it. Mary, Mac's father's making Mary, Mac, Mary, me. My father's making me Mary, Mary, Mac. Ready? Mary, Mac's father's making Mary, Mac, Mary, me. My father's making Mary, Mac, Mary, me. <laughs> Let's try that again. I left that was that was on me. I left out one part of the instructions. Let's do it together this time. Mary Mac's father's making Mary Mac marry me. I can work with that. I'm going to marry Mary to my Mary to take care of me. Well, I'll be feeling Mary when I marry Mary Mac. Well, there's a little lass and her name is Mary Mac. Make no mistake, she's a girl I want to talk. And a lot of other fellas try to get her on her track. And I'm thinking that I'd have to get up early. Mary Mac's father's making Mary Mac marry me. You can be louder than that. I've gone to Mary Mary for my Mary to take care of me. Well, I'll be feeling Mary when I marry Mary Mac. Well, this little lass, she's got a lot of crap. Got a lot of brats, and her father made the gas. And I'd be a silly ass if I let the matter pass. Her father said she treats me really fairly. Mary Mac's father's making Mary Mac marry me. I'm gonna marry Mary for my Mary to take care of me. We'll all be feeling Mary when I marry Mary Mac. Well, Mary and her mother go an awful lot together. In fact, you hardly ever see the one without the other. And all the people wonder if Mary or her mother or the both of them together is important. Mary Mac's father's making Mary Mac marry me. I'm gonna marry Mary for my Mary to take care of me. We'll all be feeling Mary when I marry Mary Mac. Irish sea shanty. You'll know this one. Sea shanty is a little sail song that the sailors used to sing when they had to work in rhythm with each other, pulling boats, raising sails, whatever they were doing. What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? Oh, look at that. You know this one? A detour. There's probably a word for that. 
about 1962-ish, in Hollywood, California. The music department of a TV studio was handed a pilot episode for a TV show. They said, here you go, here's the show, write us a song. They took Drunken Sailor, and they moved about four notes to a different place. It just kind of slid them sideways. They had kind of twisted sense of humor back then, they did. They came up with this. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale. Pay a little faithful trip. Let's start and cut this topic for Lord, this time he ship. Yeah. Drunken Sailor was the, was the basis for the Gilgit Island song. What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? Good. I'm gonna marry Mary. I'm gonna marry Mary. Care of you. Love you. Marry my Mary. That was so good. We'll do it one more time. But this last time, let's do it fast. <laughs> Mary Mac, Father, make Mary Mac marry me. Are you having fun tonight? Yes. Good, 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 good. Well, if you're having fun tonight, um, it's not me. It's really not me. You know, Judy and Rachel and the friends of the library and all these people, and, and Ruby back there with a, the microphone and the camera and all, it, they're the ones that made this happen. I just show up and sit here. Uh, so if you're having fun tonight, please thank them because this was all on them. I'd like you to believe that I randomly wandered into Waterbury, Vermont tonight. I don't think anybody randomly wanders in. Well, maybe, but uh, maybe. That's but true. It is a wee bit off the beaten path up here. I love it up here. It's a beautiful ride. So, thank you. Thank you to the friends and to all the people that are a part of this. I am, I am nowhere near the end. I just wanted to put that piece in. Um, I'm going to play for you. We've got kids here. <laughs> I'm going to play for you an English children's song. This is a children's song from England, and it dates back to about 1650. That's a long time ago. 1650. You know how many years ago that was? 1650? A couple hundred. Yeah, right. Very good. About 400. That's, that's better than I would have done. <laughs> The song is called The Elfin Knight, E-L-F-I-N-K-N-I-G-H-T, Elfin Knight, translated from the, the language of the times, because things were different back then. Elfin Knight loosely means small boy or wee little lad or something along those, those terms. This is The Elfin Knight.
Who's going to be the brave one? That's the question. You're looking at yeah, you're looking at him. I said, poor man. He said one thing and did something else. No, I didn't. The song that you know is Scarborough Fair, and as soon as I played that little bit in the beginning, pretty much all of you would have recognized that as Scarborough Fair. That song began its musical life as the Elfin Night in about 1650. It was a children's song back then. The way the folk music process works is the songs, as they pass through time, they morph and change as everybody gets their hands on them. Kind of like I did Tom Paxton's song a little bit differently than Tom Paxton did it. You just change it because that's how the process is. So the Elfin Night started off in 1650, and around 1900 it started to be called Scarborough Fair because it morphed and changed, and that's, that's how you know it today. There is a Wikipedia page for the Elfin Night, and if you go to the Wikipedia page, you can find the original words. And when you read the words from the 1600s, um, it's not word for word by any means, but as you read through the original words, you'll find the little bits and pieces that will sound familiar to you. Because little bits and pieces of what was written survived all of these years and made it into Scarborough Fair. And that's just how the whole song process works. Now the little bit that I played in the beginning, that little riff that kind of identifies the Scarborough Fair thing was not written by Paul Simon. It was written by an English folk singer named Martin Carty. And Martin Carty is still alive and he's still running around England. He's 87 or 8 or 9 years old or something now. And he wrote that back in the 40s. He wrote that, that instrumental version of it. And he taught it to Paul Simon when Paul was there at 18 years old after he got out of high school. They traveled England together. And he taught it to Paul and Paul came back. He wrote the second part to that. The canticle part was like a call and answer thing. He wrote that. And he, he wrote the mechanical part that belonged to him. The, the arrangement that he used, he kind of borrowed from Martin Carty, which is fine. You can do that, but you have to pay him for the rights. I guess that part got left, left by the wayside somewhere, but it's still a beautiful song. 1855. We're back in the 1800s again. 1855, John Hunt comes to America. He settles in Aberdeen, Maryland, which is just a little bit north of Baltimore, Maryland. He gets a job, he gets married, he has kids, he buys a house, he does all those things. John Hunt spent the rest of his life in Aberdeen, Maryland. John Hunt died in Aberdeen, Maryland. And John Hunt is buried in Aberdeen, Maryland. As I tell you the story and play for you the song that goes with it, please keep in mind that when John Hunt came here in 1855, he was 13 years old, 13 years old. Let's think about that for just a minute. And let's think about our 13-year-old child or our 13-year-old grandchild or our 13-year-old niece or nephew or just the 13-year-old kid who lives down the street. Leaving home, going to a country where he didn't know anybody, didn't know a soul, but he knew at 13 that he had to get out of Ireland he had no idea at all what he was going to do when he got to America, but he had to get here first, and he did. He came here, and he made, made a life for himself in America. There were thousands and thousands of them. He was just one. John Hunt was another one who never went back and saw his family again, nor they him. Back in Ireland, John Hunt's father, a man named Brian, could neither read nor write. Every year he would go next door because the village schoolmaster was over there, and he would sit down with the village schoolmaster and he would dictate to him all of the comings and goings of the family over the past year. Who got married, who had kids, who bought a house, who died. All of the things that we do instantly today with a text message anywhere in the world, they did once a year with the annual letter, kind of like the old Christmas letter thing that they used to do. And every letter to John included a request for him to come home and see his family again. And he never did. Jump ahead to about 1972, and a man named Peter Jones is cleaning a house in Aberdeen, Maryland. And in that house, he finds a stack of old papers. Those papers were the letters that had been written to John Hunt a hundred years earlier. They had been just tied together and stuck in a corner someplace. He took those papers, and he laid them out. There's, I believe it's 22 in the series. He laid them all out, such as they were, and he figured out how they fit together chronologically. And he turned them into something that we know today 
as the Ballad of Kilkelly Ireland, the story of the Hunt family. Kill Kelly Ireland, 18 and 60, my dear and loving son John. Your good friend, the schoolmaster, Pat McNamara, so good to write these words down. Your brothers have all gone to find work in England. The house is so empty and sad. The crop of potatoes is sorely infected, a third to a half of them bad. Your sister Bridget and Patrick O'Donnell are going to be married in June. Your mother says not to work on the railroad. Be sure and come on home soon. Kill Kelly Ireland, 18 and 70, my dear and loving son John. Hello to your missus, to your four children. May they grow healthy and strong. Our Michael has got in a wee bit of trouble. I don't think that he'll ever learn. Because of the dampness, there's no turf to speak of. We have nothing to burn. Bridget is happy and aimed a child for her. You know, she's got six of her own. You say you found work. You don't say what kind. When are you coming home? Kill Kelly Ireland, 18 and 80. Michael and John, my sons. I'm sorry to give you the very sad news. Your mother's passed on. We buried her down at the church in Kilkelly. Your brothers and Bridget were there. You don't have to worry. She died very quickly. Remember her in your prayers. It's so good to hear that Michael's returning with money he's sure to buy land. The crop has been poor and the people are selling at any price that they can. Kill Kelly Ireland, 18 and 19, my dear and loving son John. I suppose that I must be close on to 80. 30 years you've been gone. Because of all of the money you sent me, I'm still living out on my own. Michael has built himself a fine house. Bridget's daughters are grown. Thank you for sending your family picture. They're lovely young women and men. Why don't you think about coming to visit? A joy to see you again. Kill Kelly Iron, 18 and 92. My dear brother John, I'm sorry I didn't write sooner to tell you that father was gone. He was living with Bridget, she said he was cheerful, healthy right up to the end. You should have seen him playing with the grandchildren of Pat McNamara, your friend. We buried him alongside of Mother, down at the Kilkelly churchyard. He was a strong and feisty old man, considering his life was so hard. It's funny the way he kept talking about you. He called for you at the end. Why don't you think about coming to visit? We'd all like to see you again. That one is special. That one is special and special to me. It is a song that over the decades playing it, telling the story, 
it, it's attached itself to me, and it's one that uh, it's one that I play every day. Wherever I happen to be, I tell that story and play that song. And it's that important. But it's attached itself to me in many ways, and one of which I will share with you now. About 17-ish years ago, I had the opportunity to see the letters, just to see the original letters. And from there, I had the opportunity to transcribe the original letters. It was a wee bit of a challenge because the paper was 100 years old and it was folded and faded and cracked and smudged and all of those things you can imagine what the paper was like. But I got most of it. I got most of it. There's a couple places where I had to guess a word. There's a couple places where I left a blank space, but I got most of it. The 20, I think it's 22. And I tell you that so that you know this. If you, there's some cards up there with my picture on them, and there's, on the back of the cards there's all kinds of information. But one of the things that's there is my website address. If you go to my website, there is a page on the website for Kilcare Lake Ireland. And on that page, you will find the transcriptions of the first and last letter. So you can go there and read the first and last letter and get an idea of you know, what it was really like. Because the song is obviously a synopsis of a lot of things. Uh, but you'll get, you'll get an idea. And if you read the letters read on the website and it fires up your interest and your curiosity, there is a little internet button thing on the page that you can push it. should pop up an email window all addressed to me. And all you have to do is fill it in and tell me that you met me here in Waterbury tonight. And my gift to you, my thanks for coming, well, I will send you a PDF file of all 22 letters. And then you can read all of the letters and you can you can just kind of dig your way through the whole family history. Because if you Google Kill Kelly letters, you will find me. Uh, I, I, I have them I, make them, I make them available to everybody. There's not too many people that have seen the letters. Because of that, I hear from people all over the world who hear the story, hear the song, Google Kill Kelly letters. So I have sent the letters over the years, I have sent the PDF file pretty much to every corner of the world, all kinds of countries. I should be keeping the list on them. But I, I, I've sent it out more times than I can even imagine, and I would happy to include all of you on that list. But I will share one with you. Eight years ago, I got an email from a gentleman who lived just outside of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Between Atlantic City and, and the Delaware border, it's kind of a little piece of New Jersey that's kind of tucked in down here, and that's where he lived. And he Googled Kill Kelly letters and he found me and but I sent him the letters file and of course I did so. Do you remember the part of the song about the brother Michael? Michael ran off and then he came back and got in trouble and he went to the house and you know, Michael had a pretty prominent role in the song. This gentleman is Michael Hunt's great-great-grandson. <laughs> the Hunt family knew the song, they knew the story. They did not know that the letters still existed in any form. So I was able to give them the letters, and he shared them with his family. The story that I told you in the beginning about John Hunt, much of that came to me from him as we corresponded back and forth. He filled me in on, on the, the history of John and how John came to be here. So it's a, it's a very, very special story. And uh, please, if you have any interest at all, please take advantage of it. Um, I have played it, as I told you, I played it every day for, for decades now. And I never tire of it. And I've played it in rooms full of Irish grandmothers. <laughs> and you can imagine, you know, I play it and I look up and I can see the room filling with emotion. And that's a good thing. But when I play it in front of Irish grandmothers, it's, it's like over the top. <laughs> and then I, yeah, I try to make it a little sadder when I see that for them. But I will share something with you that I have learned over the years playing this song about Irish grandmothers. An Irish grandmother can hide an entire box of Kleenex on her person. <laughs> I start playing the song, and somewhere around the second verse, I'll look up, and we're, we're down here, and we're down here, and we're up this sleeve, and we're up that sleeve, and we're passing it back and forth. And from the front, it often looks like it's snowing in the back of the room, and Kleenex going back and forth. It's a hoot. So thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm going to back to the harp. I promise you that I would. Um, it has been an honor and a privilege and a joy for me to come and share the evening with you tonight. Thank you for, I know that you have choices and 
I'm glad that you were here. Um, there are, there are some, still some CDs in the world, and there, some of them are over there. Um, anything that you would be so kind to purchase and take home, I don't have to. So it, works, it works for all of us. I'm going to play you two more. Um, the first one will be my favorite Christmas tune to play on the harp. Um, I even try, when I'm playing for myself in the dark, I even play this one all year. In July, I'll play it just because I like to play it. Um, and I will finish this off tonight with the song that gets played last in the Scottish sessions all over the world. When Scottish musicians get together, we always play the same song last. I have absolutely no idea why, <laughs> but we do. And in America, it gets played at the end of the year based on a Robert Burns poem. So thank you, bless you, thank you for being here tonight. really cool. <laughs> and if I don't get it, you can just look at me and think, what a pity. <laughs> <laughs> 